All right. Thank you. I think I, we have everyone on board now, so uh, we can make a start. And I hope you can all hear me clearly. Ambulubinaka, good morning, and Akiora to you all, uh, wherever you're joining from for today's virtual seminar. And to our One Talk family, hello, Olgeta, welcome, Lo Yumi, everyone. And a very special welcome also to all our speakers and also our governors and senior management staff, if they're also joining in. Thank you for your acceptance to be part of today and to make this event a special one in our regional collaboration. My name is Caroline Wangambava and I am with the Reserve Bank of Fiji. <clears throat> and it is my pleasant task today to chair the South Pacific Central Bank's inaugural regional research seminar. I commend Griffith University together with the International Monetary Fund and the Reserve Bank of Australia and the Reserve Bank of New Zealand for this initiative. And I especially thank our conveners, Dr. Praman Sharma of Griffith University and Mr. Chris Becker of the International Monetary Fund for their hard work be behind today's program. It is a privilege indeed to be working in association with such highly esteemed institutions and colleagues. The motivation for uh, this collaboration, as we know, is to help develop capacity for research and policy making in the region. And it is very encouraging to note that since the inception of this program some five years ago, we have reaped enormous benefits from this through published research papers, peer learning and engagement and at our governor's level. And today is only part of continuing that journey. Today's seminar will run for about two hours and will include some opening remarks at the beginning and a Q&A session and closing remarks at the end. And in between, we will have three presenters, each presenting on a separate research topic and uh, each will have a discussion to respond to their respective presentation. Some housekeeping notes, since we have a tag session, I will ask each speaker to speak um, and stick to their allowed time so everyone has a fair chance to speak on their topic. I may sound a warning if a speaker is close to their time limit. Please have your mics muted and videos off when you are not speaking. And for participants, please note your questions down for the Q&A panel later. Don't use the chat during the speaker sessions because uh, we might lose the question. So I trust you are looking forward to a very productive seminar today. And so now I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Andrew O'Neill, who will deliver his opening remarks. Professor Andrew O'Neill is Professor and Dean of Research in the Business School at Griffith University. Prior to his current appointment as Dean of Research, he was head of the School of Government and International Relations and director of the Griffith Asia Institute. Working in teen, Professor O'Neill is the recipient of the Australian Research Council funding and is currently leading a major project investigating the dynamics of the Australia-US alliance since the 1950s. He has also received competitive industry public sector funding from the Japan Foundation, DFAT, and the Defense Department. He was appointed to the ARC College of Experts in 2020 and is chair of the Australian Business Dean's Council Research Network. In this latter capacity, Professor O'Neill has coordinated the ABDC's 2019 journal list review. So I now have the pleasure of calling upon Professor O'Neill to deliver his remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, let me begin uh, this morning by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land uh, that we're meeting virtually on today and pay my respects to the elders uh, past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Let me also uh, respectfully acknowledge the presence of Mr. Chris Becker, uh, Advisor Office of the Executive Director Asia in the Pacific in uh, the International Monetary Fund. Um, and uh, Chris is co-convener of this event. Uh, colleagues, including uh, senior colleagues and governors and speakers from central banks of Fiji, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Timor-Leste, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, my fellow academics. Good morning. Thank you very much for your time this morning. 
and a very warm welcome to every uh, each one of you. I'm honoured to be delivering the opening remarks of this inaugural uh, regional seminar co-convened by uh, Griffith University and IMF Washington in collaboration with uh, the RBA and uh, the RBNZ. I'm aware that the South Pacific uh, Centre for Central uh, Banking in its capacity development endeavours has been co-convening a number of virtual and in-person uh, uh, events in addition to its core function of mentoring central bank researchers in writing uh, joint working papers. This year, we have the second virtual governors forum and a presentation by the World Bank Group, where the keynote will be uh, will be delivered uh, by uh, the institution's vice president. Today's event is equally important, especially for researchers. It sounds like the beginning of a common practice at universities where researchers share their work in progress findings with colleagues for constructive feedback. Such feedback is also often obtained uh, from and through conferences. This feedback is immensely helpful in developing the research work uh, and projects to a stage where they may be submitted to good journals. These publications provide an important validation of sound research since the submitted articles are rigorously reviewed by experts in the field. As researchers in the region are experiencing, I'm sure, the process and journey from commencing a research project to completing a working paper and subsequently publishing in a good journal can be tough, but it's gratifying. There are no shortcuts with high quality research. The desire of the region's central banks to partner with Griffith to develop research capabilities has been highly commendable. That jointly you've published 18 working papers in such a short span is even more remarkable. Congratulations. You've already published some in journals and a few more are under review. This is a really exciting initiative. In the case of policymakers like central banks, the process does not stop with journal publication, as it might be in the case of academia. The working papers and published journal articles are expected to provide a sound basis for policymaking. And this is what Griffith is most excited about, the unique opportunity to make a real difference uh, to the region's private and financial sectors. So in conclusion, it's very pleasing to see esteemed institutions like the IMF, the RBA and the RBNZ being an important part of this process. In fact, being collaborators in this process. This initiative is evolving uh, to be a global academic real world model for research capacity development. So with these words, may I once again, thank every one of you for your time today and wish you a successful event. Uh, all the very best to all of the speakers. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you very much, uh, Professor O'Neill. Uh, we thank the professor for his very enlightening remarks, uh, which I believe has uh, uh, set a good pace for our seminar today. Um, thank you for the positive feedback on the, uh, this important collaborative work that you have mentioned could be a uh, you know, a, an example or model for the rest of the world. And uh, your remarks have certainly been useful. Uh, so Professor O'Neill, thank you again for being part of uh, today's seminar. Pinaka. So we now move on to our first uh, presentation. And our first presenter today is um, Ms. Kalolaini Ranandi, a colleague of mine uh, here at the bank, uh, who will present on a co-authored co paper titled Determinants of Bank Lending in PICs. Carlo has been an economist with the Reserve Bank of Fiji for eight years with research interests in monetary and macroeconomic policy and economic development in the South Pacific. She holds a master's degree from Columbia University. So I now invite Carlo to share her presentation and Carlo, you have 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you and Bulavinaka to you all. 
So thank you to Griffith for this opportunity to present um, the preliminary findings of our paper on the determinants of uh, bank lending in PICs. In terms of the significance of our paper, there are three main areas uh, we want to highlight. First, uh, banks uh, very much dominate the financial systems in uh, PICs, and so they matter for financial stability. Given that uh, banks are dynamic and very sensitive to internal and external shocks, uh, identifying the factors that uh, influence their credit expansion um, can also support uh, informed policy decision making. Second, banks um, are key providers of funds uh, to firms and households, which has implications on uh, economic growth and development, and they also play an important role in monetary policy transmission in this current country. By way of uh, background, in terms of the financial uh, landscape in Pacific Island countries, foreign-owned banks uh, dominate uh, the financial systems in Pacific Island countries. Uh, commercial banks and uh, superannuation funds uh, make up a large part of the entire uh, financial uh, systems. Banks have also been well capitalized uh, with capital ratios uh, above the minimum potential requirements. And uh, this serves as um, a safety net uh, for a variety of risks that banks are exposed to, uh, such as uh, potential political instability and natural disasters, uh, to name a few. Banks have also remained uh, profitable over the years, and a large portion of uh, their revenue uh, has been derived from uh, non-interest income, uh, such as foreign ex uh, exchange transmission, commission and fees, and uh, also interest income. However, uh, looking at uh, the banks' uh, non-performing loans, uh, they vary across the three PICs. Uh, Fiji, relative to Vanuatu and Solomon Islands, uh, the non-performing loans are very much on the lower end. Based on the, the review of uh, past studies, uh, banks' lending decisions are influenced by both demand and uh, supply factors. One of the underlying drivers of uh, lending is uh, bank capital. COSAC, for instance, uh, find that uh, tier one capital enables uh, banks to withstand periods of financial distress and maintain or even increase their lending activity. COSAC also found that uh, a high proportion of customer deposits uh, have a positive and significant influence on credit growth. Banks' uh, lending decisions are also influenced by the macroeconomic environment uh, which uh, they operate in. Uh, for instance, in a boom period, we generally expect demand for credit to pick up, while in a recession, uh, demand for credit plummets. Uh, this uh, procyclical link between bank lending and uh, economic growth uh, was observed by Dell, who argued that in, that in a boom period, uh, banks tend to relax their criteria and lend to both good and bad projects. However, in a recession, uh, most loans become non-performing and the source of credit dries up, uh, which uh, may result in rationing out of even good projects. Another important uh, factor is uh, credit risk. Uh, managing uh, such credit risk can be costly for banks uh, and therefore affects their income and profitability, which in turn can uh, erode uh, banks' capital and discourage banks uh, from uh, offering new loans. For studies in the Pacific Island countries, they are quite limited, um, specifically on bank lending. Uh, we found two studies uh, by Sharma and Banda, which, uh, which they found that uh, stronger economic growth, uh, larger deposits, and asset side, um, and asset side had positive effect on bank credit uh, for six PICs. In a more recent study, uh, the single found that uh, deposits and GDP growth contributed positively to private sector credit in PNG. For our research, we use uh, available data for 21 financial institutions, 15 banks, and uh, six uh, credit institutions. We chose three countries, uh, Fiji, Vanuatu, and Solomon Islands. The uh, dependent variable for our study is uh, change in uh, banks' uh, gross loan 
for the independent variable, so we use TO1 capital or as a proxy for capital quality. Uh, we also consider two types of uh, funding sources, uh, which are customer deposits and interbank deposits. Uh, both the variables were scaled by total assets. We use a provision for doubtful debts uh, to, total, to total loans as a proxy for bank restating level. And we also um, account for set of control variables, uh, for instance, uh, size, uh, fixed assets to total asset ratio, return on uh, assets, a measure of profitability, and uh, two macroeconomic variables, which are GDP growth and inflation rate. For our model uh, specification, we use a dynamic panel model, which is specified. And uh, the estimation technique, we consider three, which are OLS, uh, the fixed effect, and the GMN. For our preliminary results, our baseline results are generally consistent with the existing studies. For instance, we find that uh, tier one capital is mostly related to bank lending. And this implies that a higher level of uh, Capital buffer improve uh, banks' uh, soundness and strength, enabling banks to expand their lending activities. Customer deposits, uh, which are considered to be a stable source of uh, finance compared to other sources of funding, are also positively related to bank lending. Uh, interbank deposits, on the other hand, show a negative relationship. Uh, banks often use interbank facilities in case of uh, a shortage uh, in regular funding. And so a higher level of interbank transaction uh, implies a uh, reduced capacity to bank. As expected, uh, banks' uh, loan loss provision uh, is found to be negative. Higher provision uh, for bad loans uh, locks in banks' uh, funds, uh, which, which can result in cutback cut of lending activities. Uh, also, um, an increase in bad loan proportion also causes banks to initiate tighter scrutiny uh, of new loans application. Uh, which uh, leads uh, to lower lending activities. For the control variables, we find that size uh, and return on assets uh, are positively related to bank lending. And we also find that the coefficient for GDP growth is positive, uh, implying that higher economic growth uh, creates opportunities for banks uh, to extend new loans. We also divided our analysis uh, by types of depository uh, corporations. For banks, uh, our results are generally uh, consistent with our baseline uh, results. We find that um, tier one capital, uh, customer deposits, return on assets, size, and GDP growth are positively related uh, with loan growth. However, the coefficients for most of the variables have increased uh, relative to the baseline results, which indicates that the selected bank specific and macroeconomic variables have a stronger influence on loan growth uh, for banks than for credit institutions. We find similar results for credit institutions, um, except uh, that the customer deposits are insignificant, positive but insignificant. Looking at uh, our results uh, by country, uh, the signs of the coefficients remain uh, almost similar to our baseline regressions, except for a few differences. Uh, Instant, the size of the coefficient of tier one capital was found to be the highest for Fiji compared to the other two countries. And uh, the negative impact of interbank deposits on both of loans uh, only holds for Fiji. Looking at uh, the policy implications, um, there are three main areas we want to highlight. First one is uh, the banking sector development should remain a key policy. But uh, this needs to be accompanied by robust financial sector oversight and supervision to safeguard um, financial stability, uh, supporting uh, supportive institutional and legal frameworks that encourage competition, and also safeguards uh, consumer protection is also important. Uh, given that uh, the three countries in our studies are part of the Alliance for Financial Inclusion in the Pacific Island countries, uh, much has been uh, achieved and uh, currently in progress in terms of uh, improving the institutional framework. Uh, for instance, in Fiji, uh, there was a review of the Credit Consumer Act in 2017 of Vanuatu also uh, passed a competition policy paper in 2019. 
which brings me to my second point on the importance of uh, financial inclusion uh, to help uh, address the uh, savings demand and to grow banks deposit base. Uh, deposit base. Again, um, much, of the, much, of the, much of the work has been done uh, in the financial inclusion, uh, inclusion space, for instance, um, using mobile platforms and also uh, introducing rural uh, mobile banking uh, to reach the unbanked uh, segment of uh, the, the society in the three Pacific Island countries. And also uh, in terms of uh, imp improving institutional and legal framework uh, in terms of um, um, the collateral um, reg registries at the secure transaction of the community. Uh, and of course, um, banks should also strengthen the governance and risk management uh, to help maintain the corresponding banking relationships and allow for continued progress on financial inclusion. And the last point is uh, strengthening banks' risk management policies and procedures um, to support resp responsible lending and reduce credit losses. For example, uh, credit bureaus and the adoption of new technologies, uh, for instance, artificial intelligence and machine learning can improve uh, banks' risk assessment. Of course, for the adoption of new technologies, uh, banks will also need to strengthen IT policies uh, to save uh, against uh, cyber threats, uh, loss of customer information, data theft, and privacy issues. To conclude, uh, baseline uh, regression results are consistent with existing studies. We find the tier one capital, customer deposits, bank profitability, size, and GDP growth are positively related to interbank lending while interbank deposits and credit risk uh, showed negative relation. But when regressed by types of uh, depository institution, the selected bank-specific and macroeconomic variables have stronger influence on loan growth for banks uh, than credit institution. Future research can explore areas uh, which are yet to be covered in the literature for PICs, uh, for instance, uh, impact of the pandem pandemic on credit expansion, as well as the impact of natural disasters and foreign ownership. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, thank you for keeping to your time. That was uh, great. Uh, so we thank Carlo and congratulate her team uh, for this uh, work on this uh, very irrelevant topic for us, uh, you know, in PICs. Uh, knowing that we rely a lot on, on bank lending. I now have the pleasure of introducing our first discussant to share his thoughts on the paper. Mr. Severin Bernard. Mr. Bernard is an economic advisor in the economics department at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. His work covers research and policy advice on a wide range of topics, but primarily on the intersection of macroeconomics and financial markets. Part of his recent analytical work has focused on the effectiveness of unconventional monetary policy in New Zealand, and we'll be seeing him later uh, present on AMP12. He joined the Reserve Bank of New Zealand from the Swiss National Bank in 2018 and holds a PhD from the University of Bern. Mr. Bernard, I invite you now to share your presentation and you have 10 minutes. Naka. Thank you, Caroline. Let me just uh, share my screen. Okay, I hope you can all see that. Um, thank you very much for that opportunity to uh, discuss the paper. Um, there we go. So um, the, I, I put a brief summary up front. So, you know, this paper analyzes the drivers of bank lending and PICs um, and, you know, obviously motivated by the relevance for GDP and uh, or crisis. It uses a panel setup with bank level data and it finds quite significant um, impacts, uh, effects of lo on loan growth of a series of, um, of variables. Um, and then um, um, as Kalalani um, outlined, there are quite a bit of differences across the type of institution and country. Um, I'm gonna look at it primarily through a central banking or policy makers lens. Um, so let me just jump straight into it. So um, on a high level, you know, I find this an analysis is great. Um, you know, it shows the drivers of loan growth, and it's important to understand that bank lending econometrically 
I'm not the perfect panel expert, but you know, it seems very robust. We have fixed effects for years and banks, so it captures a lot, and yet we have quite um, high significance. And my main comments um, are basically like a little bit on the applicability to policymakers. So um, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna outline this in, in a bit more detail. And then the other thing is kind of a static versus dynamic thing. So do this to the results hold when we would change policy. So um, well, more on that below. And then a few econometrics questions. So that's kind of uh, on a high level what I'm going to, um, what the discussion will do. Um, so the first one is kind of um, to, to what extent are these results applicable for policymakers? Um, one is like, for example, when you think about monetary policy, if you change something, do you have a stronger transmission for banks with more capital to, you know, to take one of the variables? Um, so we learned, you know, the more capital, the on average, the higher the uh, loan growth. So, um, you know, there's quite a bit of literature on the text, for example, that, you know, this arrow in the first bullet um, that you try to use some monetary policy shocks in whatever way you take them and then see whether the bank specifics also affect the transmission of monetary policy. Um, and from a similar point of view is, you know, inspired by the macro prudential angle. So when you change something, what's, can we say anything about um, how the banks respond to such a change? I, I would find that really interesting. And I think the data set is great. And, you know, a lot of the analysis has been done. So I'm not saying the paper should have that, but, you know, maybe for extensions or further work on that. I would find that really interesting. Um, then I had a few questions on like the inflation, the first bullet here. What it, does, it, does it actually capture? So we learned that the literature, um, sometimes it's negative. So basically too high inflation, central bank hikes and that pull, uh, pushes down uh, credit growth. And in this one, it's positive. And the reason for it is um, that inflation has been below 3% on average. So uh, that, that brought me to the question, what does it actually capture? Is it like uh, similar to GDP in that case? And rather um, capturing the information um, about the strength in the, underly the underlying strength in the economy? So I will think about whether, whether it's worth exploring rather than inflation per se, to try to deviation from the target or add a square term in a way that trying to answer the question, does the role of inflation change the closer you are or you know, the closer you are to the target or if you're above the target that you know, then you would see a negative sign. So it, in other words, if inflation is super low, um, does it, lead to kind of stronger effects on, on loan growth. The other one is the exchange rate, kind of an area. So um, having three small, super small open economies, where you know, coming from New Zealand or Switzerland, both of them are small open economies. Um, I was just wondering to what extent it would be worth considering it. Um, so, you know, the banks are primarily owned um, you know, but well, from foreign, um, have foreign ownerships. So, um, but, but also the funding, to what extent do they fund domestically and um, externally? So the, um, the total consumer deficits might implicitly cover it. Then the other thing is kind of the hedging. And the Reserve Bank, um, the next point is remittances. Um, if possible, I, I would find it quite interesting to kind of augment that and, and see whether it's feasible and interesting to look at whether kind of the inflow of remittances um, the different banks have, whether that kind of can explain um, some of that as well. And then the last area, the last two bullets here, are kind of on, on a little bit on the state dependence. So the authors um, separate by, um, separate by uh, the type of the institution and also um, the, the country. I would find it interesting to look at whether post and pre-GFC or any other state dependence um, could, could lead to um, interesting insights. Um, econometrically, I, I, I realized that in some splits, the degrees of freedom can be quite low. So I was wondering just technically whether having interaction terms rather than sample splits could help with um, keeping the degrees of freedom a bit higher, particularly when you go to insurance as it gets quite low. 
Um, then there is like a, a highly significant AR1 in, in the GMM results, which is above one. So it's kind of interesting. There seems to be like a negative AR process and exploring a bit more on why that one, similar with the constant, it jumps quite a bit. Um, then a minor comment on the explanatory power here, but um, in the interest of time, I might just jump that. Then the endogeneity regarding like GDP and inflation. So credit growth leads to you know, higher GDP and that, could that feed back in the current setup? Um, the same for, in, um, for inflation, maybe a bit more, less immediately um, if you assume kind of a lag in, in, in price responses to credit growth. But um, maybe kind of just check a bit more on whether the assumptions we need um, or, you know, for the interpretation of the coefficient at least, um, uh, whether they are fulfilled. And from a data point of view, so um, we have done similar, uh, or we're doing similar work internally at the Reserve Bank. And what we what we uh, realized is that the banks might have different reporting years, or we're looking at firms, so they have like different financial years. And the paper is not really clear, but that may be just uh, worth a check that um, that yeah, we're actually comparing apples with apples, and not like apples with something else. So. The, the period over which we measure credit growth, is it matching, or, you know, or GDP, is it matching the bank's reporting years? Um, now looking forward, um, so you know, we, we had that discussion here at the Reserve Bank, uh, what happens if you come close to you know, the effective lower band or however people call it, um, then deposit rates are often sticky. That has been observed in, in abroad anyway. Um, Eurozone, Switzerland, name it. So um, that will be interesting to um, check that through time, whether um, a change in results might happen. Then particularly if you think about um, the impact of policy changes, the persistence could also be quite interesting. Um, and, and the last is kind of inspired by um, the state dependence. So could it be that um, that in a downturn, um, capital, a, a high level of capital in a certain bank or institution is even more important than in a period of average GDP growth. Um, so quant regressions could be an avenue. You know, obviously um, that's probably just like a, I framed it a, a useful starting point for the next uh, project. And uh, that's about it. Thanks again. It's it's a wonderful paper, uh, paper, and I really appreciate it um, getting the opportunity to discuss it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. We thank uh, Mr. Bernard for a very constructive feedback. Um, thank you for the questions and thoughts, uh, which I'm sure the team will consider carefully uh, in their paper, and also the issues on on looking forward. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, now we now move on to our second presentation and our next presenter is Ms. Angeline Rohoya, who will speak on another co-authored paper titled, Do Inflation Expectations Matter for Small Open Economies? Empirical Evidence from the Solomon Islands. Ms. Angeline Rohoya works as a senior research analyst in the economic research and statistics department at the Central Bank of Solomon Islands. Her areas of research include development economics, financial sector development, economic growth and public policy. She holds an honors degree in applied economics from Massey University in New Zealand. Angeline, you have the floor now. Thank you. Okay. Angeline, are you able to share your screen? Share screen. Yeah, there's a share screen button on the bottom right. There you go. Okay. Good morning, all. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. 
Okay, thank you very much, um, Caroline, for the introduction. Good morning, all, and thank you to Griffith University for giving me the opportunity to present some preliminary findings of this research paper entitled, Do Inflation Expectations Matter for Small Open Economies? Empirical Evidence from the Solomon Islands. Um, from this presentation, I look forward to receiving uh, constructive feedback. Thank you. So we begin with the significance of this research. Uh, literature shows that inflation expectations are pertinent to the inflation development process. Inflation expectations is basically the rate at which people, consumers, businesses, investors expect their price, expect prices to rise in the future. Since inflation expectations are not directly observable, requiring the need to turn to suitable indicators for assessment. Thus, for central bankers, assessing inflation expectations as early as precisely as possible is critical for timely and appropriate monetary policy setting. This leads us to two key research questions for the study. One, do inflation expectations matter for Solomon Islands? Two, what role does inflation expectations play in the formation of inflation for Solomon Islands? Is inflation dynamics a forward-looking or backward-looking process? And finally, this is one of the first known study that investigates inflation expectations in the case of Solomon Islands. Next, in terms of context of the study, Solomon Islands is a small island economy with a narrow economic base, heavily reliant on the export of primary commodities, such as logs, copper, cocoa, palm oil. Solomon Islands economic growth has generally been volatile, as seen in the top figure, over the period 2006 to 2020, with an average growth of 3.6%. In terms of inflation, from 2007 to 2021, Solomon Islands national headline inflation has fluctuated due to the economy's vulnerability to both domestic factors and pass-through effects from the external sector. Moving on in terms of the literature review, we've considered a range of theoretical and empirical studies of which some of the key literature are captured in this table. Starting with Gali and Gettler 1999, they introduced a hybrid new Keynesian Phillips curve in modeling the inflationary process in the USA for the period 1960 quarter one to 1997 quarter four by applying the GMM estimation method. By using the variables percentage change in GDP deflator and log labor income share in the non-farm business sector, their findings provide evidence of a hybrid new Keynesian Phillips curve with a more dominant forward-looking component. Tom Ford 2011 analyzes the impact of inflation expectations on the development of inflation in the USA and Germany for the period January 1990 to December 2010 by applying the VAR model and using the variables headline, CPI, marginal labor cost and output gap. They confirm the existence of the hybrid new Keynesian Phillips curve with a more dominant backward looking component. Tom Ford, so, Thirdly, Alcindia uh, Gottlaut 2017 investigates inflation dynamics in Botswana for the period 2005 quarter one to 2050 quarter two by applying the GMM estimation method. This study confirms a hybrid new Keynesian Phillips curve for Botswana and a more significant backward looking component implying high inflation persistence. And lastly, and more recently, Salunk and Patnaik 2019 estimates various specifications of the hybrid new Keynesian Phillips curve for India over the period 1996 quarter two to 2017 quarter two using the GMM model. The variables used were both consumer price index and wholesale price index, as well as the output gap, the RIA, rainfall, crude oil, and non fuel price. Their findings also confirm the evidence of the new Keynesian Phillips curve and the hybrid new Keynesian Phillips curve. When using the CPI, they found a more forward-looking behavior um, 
while when using the wholesale price index, they found a more dominant backward looking behavior. In terms of the data and models of the study, we've used quarterly time series data for Solomon Islands for the period 2003 quarter one to 2017 quarter four, representing a sample size of 60 observations. The data has been obtained from various sources from CBSI, the Solomon Islands National Statistics Office, the Bloomberg for the fuel prices and the IMF for the rear data. For this study, we've applied the hybrid new Keynesian Phillips curve model, where our dependent variable is the headline inflation rate at time T, and our independent variables are past inflation rate, past headline inflation rate, expected future inflation, fuel prices, the RIA, M0 reserve money, output gap and dummy variable used to capture major shocks in the economy. In terms of the methodology carried out for this study, firstly, we've conducted a unit test to determine the order of integration. Secondly, applied an ordinarily squares regression. Uh, thirdly, we've applied a system GMM model, which incorporates a list of instrument variables in this study, our instrument variables were four lags of headline inflation, imported food index, the RIA, and three lags of fuel and reserve money. And lastly, we've performed applicable stability tests to test the robustness of the model. Moving on in terms of the preliminary results based of this study, Based on the ADF statistics and Phillips parent statistics unit root tests, most variables except headline inflation and output gap are non stationary. Most variables except headline inflation and output gap are non stationary and therefore integrated of order one. This next slide presents the estimates generated by the OLS and the GMM models. So based on the OLS and GMM models, we've obtained statistically significant backward and forward looking components under both models with the backward looking co coefficient more dominant. Under the GMM model, we see that the backward looking component is estimated at 0.71, indicating a high level of inflation persistence compared to the forward looking component of 0.26. Secondly, the output gap and fuel prices are key to the inflationary process as opposed to monetary and exchange variables used in this study. Here we see th that under the both models, output gap is statistically significant in both models, indicating the importance of aggregate demand in the country's inflationary process. Fuel prices are also significant under the GMM model. On the contrary, we see that reserve money is statistically insignificant and registers an incorrect sign. And this could be explained by the weak transmission mechanism in the, account, in the money aggregates in affecting inflation as other channels may have played a dominant role. However, as for the RIA, although it is statistically significant in the GMM model, it yields differing results to literature. It shows a positive sign in both models, although significant under the GMM model and insignificant under the OLS. In the case of Solomon Islands, an appreciation of the rear does not directly translate into a fall in inflation. Instead, inflation still remains high, and this could be ascribed to the structural issues akin to the small island economy, such as the high cost of doing business in the country. Moving on to the policy impl implications, the findings of the study contribute to the bank's monetary policy framework and is useful for guiding monetary policy decisions, especially 
future, determining future inflation at the bank. Furthermore, this study further probes the need to further investigate the weak monetary transmission mechanism and to, exchange, and to examine the exchange rate pass-through effect onto domestic prices. In conclusion, this study confirms that inflation expectations do matter for Solomon Islands and the existence of the hybrid new Keynesian Phillips curve for Solomon Islands is relevant for model, modeling inflation dynamics in the country. Secondly, there is evidence of inflation persistence in the inflation process as demonstrated by a more significant backward looking coefficient. Going forwards, in terms of the next steps for this paper, we'd aim to incorporate comments as well as prepare and submit the journal working paper to a relevant journal. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Angeline. <clears throat> Uh, we thank Angeline and her team for their paper, uh, which provides an empirical basis for improving the monetary policy framework and also guiding monetary policy decisions for the Central Bank of Solomon Islands. It is now my pleasure to introduce our discussant for this topic, Mr. Adam Gorajek. Mr. Gorajek is a research economist at the Reserve Bank of Australia. Prior to this, he managed sections responsible for economic forecasts and the monitoring of the domestic banking sector. His work in the South Pacific includes providing technical assistance to the National Reserve Bank of Tonga and the Bank of Papua New Guinea. Mr. Gorajek is on the editorial board of the New Pacific Journal of Applied Economics and Finance. He is a PhD candidate at the University of New South Wales and holds a bachelor degree in finance and economics from the University of Adelaide. Mr. Gorajek, welcome, and you have the floor now for your 10 minutes intervention. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to discuss the paper. Um, it's, yeah, it was my pleasure to, to read it. The, um, I think I plan to start with just a high level summary of, of the paper and then a, a few comments. The objective of, of the work should, should now be pretty clear. The authors are, are trying to understand the determinants of inflation and their approach is to try to differentiate between determinants in a, in a top-down fashion, by which I mean that they're focusing on, on uh, the respective roles of macroeconomic aggregates like uh, inflation expectations, um, the output gap, exchange rates and some others. And in identifying the candidate drivers of inflation, they're borrowing from a Phillips curve literature, which initially, initially at least had a, a heavy focus on advanced and, and less trade intensive economies like the US. But um, as was noted, it has since been applied to, to more and more contexts. To differentiate between those determinants is in a credible way is, is a really challenging task. So one, there are unobservable variables that, that matter in the setup, being the output gap and inflation expectations. Two, the Solomon Islands economy is obviously a small one. Uh, that means that firm specific idiosyncratic factors tend not to wash out in the aggregate data, which is to say that the task here is to extract uh, a lot out of quite noisy information. And three, the authors have only a short time series to work with and only annual data for some variables like GDP. So a, a really challenging task for, for these guys. The outcome of the exercise is a set of results that contain um, some unexpected elements, I think. Uh, and so as is often the case in research, the authors face a difficult decision about whether to question their prior beliefs about inflation or whether to question the merits of their model. The, the unexpected elements are, are not those around inflation expectations as much as they are around uh, exchange rates in particular. Okay, so just a few comments on, on each of those elements, if I, if I may. Um, just regarding the overall question, I just wanted to mention briefly that 
are like what the authors have chosen to investigate uh, since it's it's obviously an important one for central banks in the region. And in fact, sort of giving it some more thought, uh, I thought that the role of expectations was potentially even more interesting in a Solomon Islands context because the central bank has no explicit inflation target that might otherwise anchor expectations. So for that reason, you might actually say that this is uh, a, a great place to apply uh, this sort of research question. Just on the challenges, I also thought you're really resourceful in, in trying to overcome them. Some of the statistical technology you use is, is really advanced. Um, for example, you, you work hard to estimate the quarterly output gap, even though you only have annual estimates of, of actual output. And to circumvent the fact that you actually have no observable measure of inflation expectations, you draw on the literature by using a, a generalized method of moments procedure. That procedure is perhaps the, the best you can do to circumvent that particular problem. Uh, I just thought it might be worth noting how heavily it relies on some really ambitious assumptions. Um, the one that I think is, is most ambitious is the extreme sophistication it assumes about how inflation expectations might be formed. And if that inflate, if that assumption breaks down, it, it doesn't just affect your ability to measure inflation expectations, but also means the decisions about not including lags of the explanatory variables in the regression starts to become uh, problematic. And it, this is a really difficult issue. And I, I just note that in the Australian context, we had to abandon the the GMM procedure because it performs so poorly against alternative methods for modeling inflation. Unfortunately, those alternative methods aren't feasible in your context because unlike us, you don't have measures of inflation expectations. So uh, a challenging position to, to be in. In terms of results, um, finding the exchange rates so one of, one of the findings here is that exchange rates don't matter much for inflation. That's a really surprising result for such an open economy. And actually worried that it just might not be the right message for the policymaker. And so one of my sort of more constructive comments for taking this work forward was that if you're wedded to using this type of model for, for this paper, um, then I wondered whether it might be worth refining the open economy elements a bit, whether it's actually worth spending a bit more time on, on getting those right. So ju just for example, you use, you use a, a real effective exchange rate. I understand that to be a measure of competitiveness, which is not, not really what I think you'd be after, not, not quite what I think you'd be after. And in other papers I've seen on this, although you know, admittedly, uh, that's not many papers, they tend to use import prices, a, a slightly different concept here, which, which may help, um, you know, I can't be certain that that's driving the results, but um, given how unusual they are, I think a little extra uh, focus on those elements might, might pay off. So that leaves me with a final thought about the approach that future work for the, the Solomon Islands might, might take on this topic. Um, and in particular, should it take a different route? And I, I say that because the current approach, even if you are happy with the assumptions it makes, is extra challenging to use for forecasting. Because to use it to forecast even one period ahead, you'd want a real-time measure of the output gap, which is hard already in advanced economy settings, but even more difficult when you have annual data that's on GDP that's released with a lag. You'd also want a real-time measure inflation ex of, of inflation expectations. Um, so, in the, in the Solomon Islands context, to be using this framework for forecasting, you'd also have to be forecasting those other elements, which is adding further to the challenges um, for, for, for using this for, for policymaking. So one, one promising that I, 
promising thing that I thought might be tried is, is that if it's not already in place at the central bank, um, is a component level model. And so what you might do there is focus on imported inflation, first of all. You'd start with the price changes in the relevant goods as measured in the countries that you import from, convert the price change into local currency terms, empirically assess the lag with which that change starts to appear locally, and then aggregate up all those components. And once you have sort of this, this imported aggregate, you map it to the domestic one. Uh, I raise that approach because it's one that's been applied successfully elsewhere in the Pacific to actually look quite some way into the future. It's quite simple and transparent. And part of the reason it works well is that the cost structure of domestic goods is affected heavily by imported inflation. And judging by this chart that you had in your paper, that's also the case in the Solomon Islands context. You know, it's, it's quite possible just judging from this chart that if you understand the, the process, we can forecast imported inflation, it might help you do a, a, a good job of forecasting domestic and hence total inflation as well. Anyway, uh, just, just a potential idea for, for future work that was inspired by this great paper um, since this is an idea adopted in some of the other central banks in the region, it's also an opportunity for some more central bank collaboration. I'm happy to discuss it further if you wish. Uh, but with that, um, I might just wrap up and say, say thanks for the opportunity to, to discuss this paper again. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gorodzic. <clears throat> we thank uh, Mr. Gorodzic for his very constructive feedback and a useful intervention. I'm sure that uh, this has provided a lot of food for thought uh, for Angeline and her team uh, in, in uh, completing their paper. I note the uh, surprise on the exchange rate. So there's a lot of issues and we thank you uh, for your intervention. Ladies and gentlemen, we now move on to our last presentation uh, in this seminar. And I have the pleasure of inviting back Mr. Bernard, our earlier discussant, to present on his topic of how does the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, I'm sorry. That's all right, uh, sorry. Did I interrupt you? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Bernard. Yes, uh, and he will, he will speak on the topic of how does the Reserve Bank of New Zealand analyze, assess, and deploy its alternative uh, monetary policy tools. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I did mention earlier uh, that, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Reserve Bank of New Zealand uh, works on uh, a lot of unconventional monetary policy tools. Uh, so, Mr. Bernard, uh, we welcome you back, and you can now your uh, share your presentation, and you have 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay, can uh, I hope you can all see the slides? Um, uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay, hold on. Sorry. Um, okay, I hope now it's better. Uh, yes. Okay. Yep. Good. Okay. Um, thanks very much for um, having me again. Um, and kia ora in. Uh, in, uh, in New Zealand, as we say. So um, when, when, when choosing the topic of this, we, we kind of opted for a mix of uh, a little bit of insight into policy because uh, we went through that, uh, well, as everyone else, but um, so we had these tools and then kind of, we, we had to come up with quite a process to um, determine which one do we want to use. And, but then, um, so we also embed uh, work that is undergoing at looking at how effective these tools have uh, have been. So ex ante, you have to come up with something and then ex post, you, you want to know whether it, it's done, you know, um, as, as much good as you, you expected. So um, the usual disclaimers uh, apply. So, you know, the way I present is this is my personal opinion. 
um, and not that after Reserve Bank, etc. And then um, that work is still um, in the drafting stage or even uh, preliminary. So, you know, whatever I show you, please do not share a quote to use uh, without prior consent. Now, um, from content, so in a policy, the, the questions I kind of want to touch here is what did we use and when, but also what tools do we have? And then primarily, what are the criteria the Reserve Bank choose, choose uh, or chose to, um, to select the tools at what time, um, at what, yeah, so, um, and, but then to the analysis, so how do we analyze the effectiveness and then show to ongoing examples as mentioned. Now, um, Broadly, um, we considered six tools. Um, they're called uh, alternative monetary policy tools. I think these days it's um, additional monetary policy tools. The literature knows them as unconventional. Um, so tools that we had under active and still have under active consideration um, are here uh, forward guidance. And now within forward guidance, I should mention that there are different types as you may be aware of. So you got like the transparency related thing, which the Reserve Bank has always done. So publishing forecasts um, and you can publish them in different ways. Now the forward guidance we're talking here is more like the unconditional one where you actually say, we're gonna keep the, um, you know, the OCR policy rate until a certain date or until certain conditions are met. So it's more this unconditional or state dependent forward guidance we're talking about. Then uh, most of you might be familiar that we um, considered and implemented um, quite a substantial large scale asset purchase program or QE. And um, as we're gonna see, we also did a funding for lending program, which is basically giving cheap funding for, for banks. Then um, we also have three other tools, which we, they're still under active consideration. So one is kind of a negative interest rate. And as we're going to see that kind of the assessment of it has changed over time and interest rate swaps. So that would be engaging in the swap market to ensure that um, that in a way it's related to kind of some sort of yield curve control. So you would you would, you would be willing to uh, either buy or sell swaps um, such that um, they trade in a certain region. And the last one is what we call the purchases of foreign assets. Um, others may say these are foreign exchange interventions. Now, um, here in the first bullet, um, sorry, in the, in, the, in the top bullet, you see that we also analyze combinations thereof. So these are the tools, but you know, you might combine them. They might have, there might be complements or they might be substitutes. Um, so that was kind of an additional complexity. It's not only the six tools, which is you know quite a, quite an amount already. It's also combinations. So here's a, a, a short uh, timeline. So maybe one bullet, which is not here is February. So we had a February um, 2020, we had a pretty good outlook. Corona was a risk, but it wasn't really clear where it was heading, particularly at the time we made the forecast. So that surprised the market a bit on the upside. And then it, it all happened quickly, as you may remember. So on the 16th of March on a Monday morning, um, the Monetary Policy Committee decided to, um, in an unscheduled meeting here, decided to um, cut the OCR, our policy rate, by 75 basis points. And it provided um, unconditional forward guidance, which is basically saying we're going to keep it at that level for at least 12 months. And the interesting bit I thought is worth mentioning here is that negative rates were ruled out, at least for that period. So it was more or less explicitly stated that these 25 basis points are considered a lower limit. Um, then um, a week after, and there was quite some turmoil on financial markets, um, the Monetary Policy Committee again on a weekend decided um, to implement um, the large scale asset purchases. Initially up to 30 billion, that was back then, about, well, that was below the 60% of the market, uh, of the size of the um, New Zealand bond market, um, of government bonds. And then in the next rounds, so roughly two, you know, two and a few months later, we extended um, this LSAP to up to 100 billion. And um, one of the key things here is that Treasury um, issued quite a bit of bonds. So otherwise, 
this the, the 60% here, we, we would have run into problems because the entire bond market would have been smaller than the 100 billion. And then towards the end of the year, um, the attention turned towards the, uh, the flip here, the funding for lending program um, as kind of the next uh, cap down the rank. So in November, the NPS here is our statement. So that kind of these are the, the, the big uh, monetary policy um, assessments. And then we have interim, which are called reviews. So we announced that this flip is coming in December and then in December, we implemented it um, up to with, with the duration of three years. And the price of that was floating with the policy rate. And then um, early this year, um, we, publicly stated that, oh, I'm sorry if it, I hope you don't hear that noise, um, that the OCR is the likely next tool if further stimulus is needed. And I might even add one bullet, which I haven't got here, is that um, that's now the attention turns forward. You know, so this was basically early 21 if further stimulus is needed. And now, you know, public discussion is already about, you know, maintaining or withdrawing stimulus, et cetera. So how did we get to that change from forward guidance initially from this cut, calling it the lower limit and then moving to LSAP then to the flip and then back to the OCR or negative rates. And this is kind of um, on the next few slides. So we, um, we, we used for this purpose, we used like five principles. Three are directly to the, um, related to our remit um, to the objectives. Um, and then we have like two a bit more operational ones. So the first, and maybe a lot of people would say that, that you know, the most important is the effectiveness. So if we choose that tool, does it have a material effect on, um, sorry, um, in, in um, easing monitored, monetary conditions in New Zealand? Then the second and third are more like on the stability of financial system and whether we distort um, the efficient allocation, um, favor certain, you know, industries, etc. So there is a lot of um, other assessments here that financial system soundness, that's a lot about kind of financial stability. And then we had two principles, uh, which are more from an operational point of view, it's basically the public balance sheet risk. So if you have two tools, the idea is, if you have two tools, which have a similar impact, similar effectiveness on the top, does, does one of them have a, a, a lower public, uh, sorry, a lower risk for the public balance sheet? Um, and then obviously, you, you know, you might be inclined to use that one. And the last one is actually the operational readiness. So for negative rates, that became a little bit of an issue because um, we have learned um, that um, the banks, you know, some banks had kind of uh, some operational hurdles in um, making sure that the um, that they're actually capable of um, um, handling negative rates. Um, so, and that was basically also one of the reasons why we now stated in 2021 that you know the banks are operationally ready, and so you know we're we're kind of willing to use negative rates now. Um, so, and. Sorry, I might go back. So these are the principles. We've heard about the tools. And then the assessment um, is basically in a, you know, it's, it's kind of in a qualitative way. So you, you apply each principle here in rows to each tool on columns and you do it relatively. And we did it relatively to just like a conventional OCR cut. Um, and this then was kind of the foundation. So we did this and it changed through time. Let's call it, for example, the operational readiness here. I mentioned it for the negative rates, third column here. Initially that was, you know, red banking sector is not ready or not ready to the extent we, we, we need it. And now this year, you know, it, it turns turned green. Um, there might be still some small hurdles, but we, you know, um, it's, it's, it's fine to use it basically. So we did it a lot of time during, um, during the last year or since we started the work on these tools. And then um, 
that basically we do this assessment, we constantly update it, and then it goes to uh, the monetary policy committee, and then we discuss it, and you know we usually come up with a recommendation, and then the decision is made entirely by MPC. Now, um, within that, the effectiveness required a lot of ex ante. So, you know, as as it holds for everyone else, ex ante, you don't necessarily know uh, what you expect from the tools. So, luckily. Um, you know, there is quite a bit of international evidence. So that was basically the approach. You take the international evidence and then you check to what extent do we think, um, do they, you know, does this evidence apply for New Zealand? Um, and this is now one of, um, d'horizon, as the French would say, um, about two projects which I'm involved um, in that look at the analysis of the effectiveness ex post. So one avenue, sorry, the overarching goal is, you know, the impact of AMP tools. You want to validate the effectiveness exposed. And the problem here, the second kind of uh, top level bullet here is that the existing approaches typically have a problem with the unconventional tools. So you have to change in transmission channels or, and you also have a timeliness of the approach. So we don't have GDP, you know, there was COVID. So GDP wasn't maybe particularly reliable. So if you rely on kind of um, approaches that measure monetary policy shocks in a traditional way, you might need to wait too long. Um, so one of the approaches we, we did, I did with a, with a colleague is basically calculate UMP monetary policy shocks for New Zealand. And what we did is relying on an event study uh, approach. So um, there is a type we here that should be 2005. That's kind of one of the seminal papers here. So you take um, financial as um, asset prices from financial markets. And in 2005, Gürkenjak et, um, et al. showed that two factors are kind of um, useful to explain the, the variation in these asset prices. Um, but that was pre-GFC. So these, um, the asset prices that went in, in here are basically short-term interest rates. Now, Swanson extended that um, to also include um, longer term bond yields, so two, five year, up to 10 year. And then he showed that including that, you A, need to add an additional factor, but B, you can interpret that as an LSAP factor. And we're gonna um, just see um, how they look like. And then there is a, another approach which basically extracts the entire yield curve. It's from Abu, Rogers and Wu. Um, and I should mention here that we had to adjust it slightly for non-intuitive shocks. I'm going to show that. Now, the main outcome is that these new shocks captured the new tools. And they have a significant, well, they still have a significant effect on financial markets. So they're actually capturing something that moves markets, which is a good thing. But that we still have um, some potential issues with the identification. One of the reasons for that is that the LSAP sample is relatively short. So we have one year of LSAP, but the overall sample is 20 years. Um, and then, you know, these factors which basically want to cover the LSAP might be driven by 20 years of other data. So um, just a high level overview, you see that, sorry, um, this is basically since 2000 until today. And then you see, first of all, that these shocks come in clusters. Um, you got the GFC here in the middle on the right. Um, one is that already before Corona, COVID in 2020, you got like a, this is basically the implementation of a new remit, new governor, et cetera. So that led to a little bit of uncertainty about the reaction function, which is then kind of translated in these shocks. But you see after that, there is not much more. And then, um, so that's kind of a second, um, that's the second approach with the ELSA factor here, this purpley line, and then we have another one, but they all show, you know, they're comparable, which is good to kind of justify um, it. You know, they, they, they have like a similar history. So we treated them as reasonable. Now, uh, maybe a bit more interesting what they measured with the announcements last year. So we have this OCR cut here, that was um, 75 basis point cut. We see that this is the traditional approach. And that was able to capture the OCR cut. But then with the LSAP, um, the third here, um, the third observation here, it was largely unchanged. And that's basically one of what, what was one of the reasons why we 
chose, sorry, I added these lines here. So um, the second approach with this L sub factor, which is red, captures that way better than the first. So they seem to work and these shocks look fairly intuitive. So when we announced the LSAP that led to quite a bit of an expansionary monetary policy surprise. And then this is basically um, the third approach and I'm gonna skip that in the interest of time. So there is some discussion here about the, um, uh, the adjustment we had to make. And then um, what we also did is basically here um, on the persistence. So we, we checked they have a significant impact on the um, on financial markets. And here, um, I'm gonna wrap it up pretty soon, um, that the impact is quite persistent. So this is basically the impact on the TWI um, up to 50 trading days um, after the initial announcement. So these, they have a pretty, uh, into, most of them have a pretty intuitive and long lasting impact. So these new approaches are basically showing that the new tools Sorry, I'm going to skip that here. I'm a bit running out of time. Um, but so they show that you know the new um, tools or the announcement about the new tools they have they move financial markets as well. They move them in in a kind of a way which is intuitive, and um, through that we think the new tools um, have been effective. Right. So what we yet have to um, learn is basically. Um, how much the impact on GDP, et cetera, is, but that one, you know, needs further time until we get the observations. So I'm, I'm, I'm stopping here, Caroline. I, I realize I'm out of time. Thank you, Mr. Bernard, for the excellent uh, presentation. A lot of uh, uh, things there for us to uh, think about uh, as, uh, you know, central bank, a lot of lessons, certainly for our small uh, central banks. Uh, on how we can uh, think about what more we can do, um, especially during this post-COVID period and what impact uh, we can expect. So thank you again, uh, Severin. Our last uh, discussant for this topic is uh, Professor Talok Singh. Uh, and among his major roles in the academia and among central banks, Professor Singh is co-convener co -convener for the South Pacific Center for Central Banking. Professor Singh, welcome to the forum. We really appreciate you agreeing to be a last minute change as discussant for this topic. And we invite you now to share your feedback. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karenin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be a discussant uh, on a topic which is so topical uh, in today's time. And uh, thank you, Severin, for your nice and systematic presentation and covering the challenges uh, faced by the monetary policy. Uh, you have nicely summarized the new uh, innovative tools of the monetary policy and toward the end, evaluating ex ante the you know, performance or the effectiveness of those tools. Now, my comments like will are more of a generic because um, the, the situation we are facing today is a, the world where which is surrounded by the uncertainty and the central banks have to come and step in to to revive the economy now looking back looking um recursively from our end goal that of reviving the economy uh, through boosting the demand the aggregate demand and that we are trying to revive the economy uh, which has faced a supply shock, initially the supply shock, then a mix of demand and supply shock. Now the monetary policy handling the supply shock or a mix of supply and demand shock using the demand tools, um, which are basically the interested directly with the monetary policy conventionally used to do it. And then uh, linked to the interest rate is the exchange rate channel, a channel which we normally do it. Uh, the problem currently is that the is interest rate really linked to the investment. Uh, perhaps the sensitivity of investment to the interest rate is not really that strong. It's not the uh, two days. It is for the years that when we uh, estimate the investment function, the elasticity of investment with regard to interest rate is low. So in that case, it's a mix of interest rate and uh, exchange rate channel normally, which are used for the monetary policy. 
to revive the economy. Now, given that during the recession, when the inflation goes down, then the reducing the interest rate really does not reduce the interest rate. So in that case, so the interest channel, which was already not very effective, so that doesn't work anymore further. And in the current time, the exchange rate channel, which is the relative, exchange rate is the relative price of one currency compared to the other currency. So the channel becomes ineffective. So given that the monetary policy now, as you have noted, is adopting the conventional tool where the money multiplier is not getting through and the, 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 the central banks are directly pumping the money supply into the economy by buying those assets, giving the assurance that those like the forward looking measure, which sorry, now the uh, forward guidance measure, which you have said, which is based on the forecast. Now, again, forecast, again, is a subjective thing. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy when the, the, the expectations are low, the central banks forecast or anyone's forecast will be low as well. So forward guidance is a good step uh, that giving the assurance, unlike the GFC where the central banks were uh, providing the loan uh, on a short term basis, uh, subprime mortgages, and the people who are not really knowing what will happen, what will happen to the interest rate in the long run. So here, giving the assurance to the to the people, at least it is a way. It's a good way uh, to revive the expectations. So at the end of the day, it is all about the expectations about the economy when other channels are not working. So if Central bank is able to revive those expectations you during the uh, using the forward guidance. It will be a good step there, but the revising those expectations will be a big challenge. And second, the central banks uh, buying the assets of the corporate directly, large scale assets. It is rather than government securities because during the recession, uh, people will prefer, or the, even the banks will prefer to buy the safe assets, which are the government security, but not the risky assets, which are the corporate securities. So by directly buying those assets, so large scale asset purchase, uh, buying those assets is a good step uh, because no one is going to buy those assets. So central bank steps in buying those assets there. Uh, going towards the negative interest rate, negative interest rate, is a good theoretical proposition, but practically how do we implement it? And also the negative interest rate is going to uh, encourage hoarding. And most important part of the negative interest rate is what signals would it send to the market uh, in terms of the expectations about the future. So that is a concern. Um, anyway, when the, when, when the inflation is high, real interest rate goes negative anyway. But making the nominal interest rate negative um, is may not be a right step because in terms of the message it would send to the it, uh, to the economy. At the end of the day, it is the expectations or in Keynesian terminology, the animal spirit, which is important for reviving the economy. So I think the monetary policy is doing the best it can, um, but at the same time, like the Keynesian uh, approach to the fiscal policy during the Great Depression, it is an important message to send that that the 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 measures are adopted towards taking the precautionary steps, controlling the controlling the COVID spread so that the people are hopeful for the future. The, they are expecting something good happening. Central bank is managing, it's a management tool in the short term. It's a step in, in the short term, but the side by side steps we need to have, have a focus on so that while the central bank is standing in to short, for a short term management, the economies are recovering so that the expectations survive and the economies recover. Um, Giving, keeping the interest rate low because interest rates are already low to 0.2, uh, uh, 0.2 uh, 25 basis, 0.25%. Uh, uh, now, it's a good thing. The low interest rate is a good thing because it's a low cost of borrowing, but at the same time, it doesn't set a good signal to the economy. So low interest rate is is, is a reflection that the economy is not doing good. So when the reserve bank reduces the interest rate, it's a good thing because it, it lowers the cost. But at the same time, it also 
uh, sends a signal that the economy is going down. And when people feel the economy is going down and that expectation becomes self-fulfilling, so it may not have much effect on the economy. Uh, low interest rate because of the uh, reversal of the expectation, downward reversal of the expectations. So it is a complex environment in terms of the uncertainty where the trade is not happening. Uh, like the previously we used to say, quota restrictions on trade. Now I would term it as the covered restrictions on trade, which is same thing. Uh, like a quota. Now the code has put a restriction with the zero, uh, almost very, very minimal trade happening. And that less trade is causing the cost push inflation into the economy. So that's another challenge which the central bank would be facing. Now forecasting during this time is a challenge for the central bank where we, we are looking at the forward guidance and that depends on the forecast and forecast in nowadays time would be a challenge. In general, forecast is a forecast but especially during the depression and a typical unique kind of a shock, uh, the COVID. Uh, previously, the IMF predicted a weak uh, shape recovery, but that V-shape recovery, again, the forward guidance I'm referring to, V-shape recovery were contingent on the hope that this COVID will go away and the economy will boom back to their previous level. But the COVID persisted and is persisting. And that situation, uh, it is it is a big challenge. New new policy tool are I would say not really too new, for the reason that conventionally Reserve Bank used to send reducing interest rate means uh, providing more supply more money supply. Now the central banks are providing the money supply directly by borrowing the corporate bond, which some of the central banks, uh, not New Zealand, New Zealand has a very good track record of inflation targeting. Uh, some of the central bank, which is similar to quantitative easing. Uh, so those, those are basically pumping the money supply into the economy. But by doing so, central bank is, central bank is not assuming too much uh, of a burden, uh, bypassing the, 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 the commercial bank. Of course, commercial banks bond buy those risky assets. So central bank has to do it. Commercial banks would prefer the government security. So central bank needs to step in. But doing so, in it could create a moral hazard problem for the corporate in the future, uh, given the uncertain environment. I think I will wrap up my comments because the discussion is so lively. The presentation was so interesting. The discussion could go on, but I will close my comments on there that yes, it is a good step. Uh, in in the in the direction of finding giving some kind of insurance to the public that the interest rate won't change in the near future uh, okay go ahead but those loans are not for five years loans are maybe for 10 years 20 years or 15 years so but it's still it's a good step there at least it revives some hope i think i'll close here before uh, the uh, the convener asked me to close so thank you very much for a nice presentation and for the opportunity to comment on a very interesting uh, and topical issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Singh. Uh, we really appreciate your intervention today. So thank you again for your comprehensive, uh, constructive and very useful response coming from a former central banker yourself. So thank, thank you again. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we now uh, go into Q&A and uh, I trust that uh, you have some questions ready uh, for our panelists and presenters. So I welcome you to ask your question. Uh, you could unmute yourself and ask your question, or you could pop it in the chat. Um, either one will work. So now the floor is open and I welcome you to ask any question. So maybe I'll start with a question that was posed uh, for Angeline. Um, and the question now uh, was from um, Edmondonka. Uh, and it asks, can you explain more detail how did you measure expectation, future inflation in your presentation? Angeline, you want to take that? Okay, thank you um, for the question. Um, in terms of measuring, measuring the um, inflation expectations in the paper, um, what I've used is the um, one period lead um, headline inflation um, to model inflation expectations. Um, this is because um, literature, well, literature shows that 
um, countries they've used surveys or advanced countries, they have surveys or bond yield curves to model the in inflation expectations of businesses. But for our case, we do not have that um, readily available data from um, surveys for businesses and especially at long time series. So what we've used um, for this study, um, we've used the um, headline inflation, but uh, using the headline inflation to a future um, one period uh, ahead or lead, uh, sorry, a, la a lead for the headline inflation rate. So that's similar to what um, studies that have used this approach, um, similar into the literature by Sendia Gotla 2017 and Salunk and Pratik 2019. So yeah, that's in terms of the um, measuring the inflation expectations. I hope that answers your question. And moving on to the second um, question in terms of, um, I see here that the Solomon Islands engage in fuel hedging. Mm -hmm. And if so, how is that accounted in this paper? Um, well, as I understand uh, the Solomon Islands, um, there is a cap that fuel importers are placed on fuel and, um, in terms of the prices and also the government um, does um, uh, impose uh, controls, price controls on the fuel um, so that because fuel is highly volatile and that it transmits strongly into domestic, uh, domestic prices. And so the government does put a cap on trying to control inflation so that because we are a small island economy, it's highly um, a main fuel is an important, uh, um, important in various business activities. So there is a price control there. And yeah, and if so, how is that accounted for in this paper? Um, not indirectly, not directly, but I guess that's through the um, head, the inflation. Um, yeah. Yeah, may I? Yes. Over may I add um, my response to the questions on mating the inflation expectations? Uh, expectations are about future and they are not observable. So we try to use proxies for the future expectation. And the best proxy is the lab, one period lag inflation. It is based on the assumption that at time t the agents which are the households or the firms they take into account all the available information when forming or the expectation about price at time t and if the market efficiency hold and if the transmission process is perfect then the inflation next year should not be different from the inflation today so that is the reason we theoretically economic reason behind that we use one period lag uh, as as a proxy for future uh, inflation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Singh. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, if I may, uh, I have a question for Severin. Um, you mentioned forward guidance uh, in uh, your presentation. Uh, and my question is, uh, you know, to what extent uh, is forward guidance important in the uh, implementation of uh, AMP tools uh, for RBNZ? Uh, thank you. So, um... So I, I presume that you, you you're speaking about the kind of the un, un, um, the unconditional forward guidance. Um, I think Tarlock um, mentioned it. You know, uh, discussed it pretty nicely. Um, it's basically the idea that you have lower interest rates for longer than um, you know, kind of a Taylor rule would imply, and this expectation about future lower interest rates feeds back into today's real you know real interest rates and that that you particularly like in dsg models that has a super strong impact in theory um now um you know i, I acknowledge that um, you also send a signal just the fact that you have to do forward guidance sends a signal as tarlock outlined it so you know these kind of effects they have quite a bit quite a bit um 
uh, a discussion in the literature, you know, some call that the information effect. And then, so you have these two kind of um, competing things um, of forward guidance, but um, maybe this information thing, you know, the signal you send, just the fact that you have to do it, the outlook must be bad. You have to with any tool. You know, when you do an LSAP, sorry, um, asset purchases, when you do forward guidance, any of them will basically say, oh, we have to do something, it might be bad. But um, nevertheless, you still have lower expected interest rates than you would have without that. So um, now there is a, a little bit of a challenge um, and maybe it's worth saying that because we, we have done this other type of forward guidance in the past, you know, always showing um, um, an interest rate projection that we now have kind of an interesting situation where we do both types of forward guidance and reconciling the two is kind of a bit of a challenge just you know like from an operational point of view what is the projection that is consistent with this unconditional forward guidance but also consistent with the modeling you do which gives you the projection um i'll stop here um, you know follow up if you if you if you if i shall explain a bit more thank you uh, very insightful Thanks, Severin. Do we have any other question? Uh, we still have uh, some time for questions. Um, may, may I ask one question for Severin uh, in terms of the new monetary policy tool? Uh, uh, are they really effectively new compared to the conventional one, or they are just the renamed version of the conventional way of providing money supply? The only difference I see is that the that the central banks are or they are buying those large scale assets from the from the corporates, which are risky assets, which otherwise people or the commercial banks won't buy it. Uh, it is a way of like salvaging the conventional way the, when the banks bank fail, the central bank come in to protect the, the failing bank in the interest of financial stability. So nowadays in the liberalized environment, central banks are backing off and they are not protecting, they let the bank handle their own affairs. Now it is similar to that, instead of protecting the bank, now the banks are trying to protect, though the central bank is trying to protect the failing corporates by buying their security. So is it not the same concept which was conventionally used to save the bank, to salvage the bank? So in that case, I, I, I would be interested to know how different this new tools are from the conventional tool of one, uh, saving, the convention, saving the failing banks, which is similar to saving the failing corporates now by buying their securities and lowering the interest rate conventionally and now pumping the money supply directly into the economy. So how, what major difference do these tools make <clears throat> compared which we claim as the uh, new point policy tools? Thank you. It's quite a deep question. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try as, uh, and answer as, as much as I can. So in principle, yes, you're expanding. I think it's fairly similar. And some people, you know, um, call them not really unconventional for that reason. You increase the money supply and then you hope that that has an impact. Um, I, I, would, I would say um, that you probably have a few. Um, so one is the maturity. So, you know, you're not just kind of giving them short-term repo or increase the money supply through short-term. So you explicitly go long-term because the short-term interest rates are constrained. So that's maybe a difference. Then the other one is, that um, it's also the environment. So, you know, the recent literature shows that QE and LSAP is particularly effective when you have tensions on um, money markets. So there's kind of an additional element to that. Um, so then I hope that answers you. Your question, Tarlok, to, you know, for me, <laughs> they're new, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't there when like uh, the Reserve Bank or, you know, the Swiss National Bank or whomever did uh, money supply that was end of the 90s. So, um, yeah, it's maybe like uh -huh. a generational difference. Um, I've just seen a, uh, another question, sorry, Ca uh, Caroline, in um, how much for forward guidance is appropriate. So I see Adam has his hands up, but I might just step in. Um, I think that's a, a trade-off. The more forward guidance, um, 
you know, a lot of people think they're more effective, but then policymakers are pre-committed and they're super reluctant at doing it. So it's um, striking this balance between um, having an effect because you do something which commits them, but not too much. And that's something you have to find internally. And it depends on the risk appetite of uh, policymakers and all that. Um, can, I, can, I, can I comment? Uh, I think um, I don't know how much time would we have on this because the topic is so interesting. I think your presentation was very interesting. Uh, and the monetary policy is on the forefront and is always on the forefront when something happens. Uh, fiscal policy always comes at the last uh, uh, to rescue the to the to the economy. So now using these terminologies as the new tool is uh, even though they may not be effectively different because at the end of the day, if we have to we have to all admit that the central bank has nothing more than. Uh, changing the price of the assets they are reducing the interest rate whether it does it directly or does indirectly by providing the money supply and when the interest rate average is um, close to zero which is 0.25 percent uh, almost zero so uh, one could put it in this way that the monetary policy has reached its dead end because nothing more can be done it's like the keynesian liquidity trap it is caught in so now by using this terminology of uh, the new tools of monetary policy is in a way, one way is a good way to make the people feel that something new is coming and form some kind of expectations about a good future, even though these tools may not be really new tools, but people could, if the people believe it and they form expectations about the future, and that will be a good way uh, to at the at the end of the day, it will be the formation of expectations of a good future, good outlook, and all that matters is that. So, if that these tools they are really people believe it, it could form some kind of expectation and help in some way in reviving the economy. So, one is the financial markets. The alternative to financial market, another point I'm making is an alternative to financial markets are is the housing market. The Fisher effect, which we call it uh, the real interest rate, I redefine those Fisher effect as the relative interest rate, where the real R is where is the difference between inflation, which is the rate of return on the housing market, uh, asset price inflation, the real uh, asset inflation, uh, minus the, the, the nominal interest rate, which is the rate of return on the financial assets. So, when you change the interest rates relatively, uh, the nominal interest rate uh, relative to the rate of return, which is inflation on the housing market, uh, it doesn't make any effective difference to the, both these markets, the real estate market and the financial markets. So in that sense, the central banks at the end of the day have to send some kind of a signal uh, to revive the expectations in one form or the other. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Singh. We have a question in the Q&A panel. Um, Angeline, would you like to start that off and maybe other panelists could help as well? Question is um, on unobserved variables. So I think you can, uh, you, you got that, Angeline? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, this question, uh, thank you, um, in terms of if there are unobserved variables, inflation, example, inflation, solar matters, without how can we reflect, how can we rectify this? Um, I think that's a good question to consider. Um, and shall I ask Talok? Yeah, so I, I am not, uh, firstly, I did not really get the question. And I am assuming that the question is that if it is unobserved, how do we rectify it? There is no way, future is unobserved always. And there is no way we can see into the future. That is the plain answer. So we can only use some guess, which we call it a proxies about the future. 
uh, that is the reason we are using the, the expectations. It is on the understanding that the price tomorrow is no different from the price today. That is the, a strong understanding. The reason is today, if I, if I do something uh, in, sim in simple form, if I do something or take some decision, I take into account all the available information in making that decision. All means all. But if I use that all information, tomorrow's prices should not be different from today's prices because I have used all the information uh, in today's decisions. So that is the basis for forming the expectations about the future. And that is the reason for using one period lag uh, for using the uh, as, a, as a proxy for, for inflation. And that is always the case in any sphere you take uh, when we discuss about the future. So. So one, so if my, it, as I said, my answer is based on the understanding that I have understood that the question this way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Singh. Uh, there's a question on the chat. Uh, Severin, I'm not sure if you want to add anything to that, to your answer. I, I can very briefly. I see Adam has his hands up as well. But so the identification is kind of a twofold. So two approaches use event studies, so very short windows. So the chance that something else drives these shocks is, is, is quite small. So we go down to two hour windows. And then the factors are rotated by assumptions. Um, we, we follow the literature, but um, so one is a target factor and the other one is a path which is more forward looking and then the assumption for example in one is that the second is statistically unrelated to uh, changes in super short uh, interest rates and then the other approach the third one is using identification through heteroscedicity so it compares event days and random other days and then you basically work on the relative increase in the variance so they're combining it, it's the Rigobon sac literature on identification through heteroscedicity, and that allows you to strip out noise from what you actually want to capture the um, monetary policy shock. Um, happy to follow up, or you know, by email or here we have time, but maybe we give someone else the opportunity as well to speak. Thank you, Severin. Uh, Adam, we give you the floor, and. Uh... If uh, there are no burning questions after that, uh, we will uh, go into our closing. Thank you, Adam. Thanks. There's actually another hand up among the attendees. I'm not sure if you saw that. <clears throat> um, Severin, I just wanted to ask you yet another question, sorry, uh, but one that I think is relevant for the, the central bankers on the call. Have you, have you had a chance to think about whether the unconventional policies used by uh, Larger, larger country central banks like the RBNZ, RBA, and indeed um, the, the euro area and, and, and uh, North American central banks are, are appropriate um, in, the, in the small uh, Pacific Island country setting? Um, I would, I would oh, it's, it's a very good question, challenging as well. So. Um, maybe start from our experience. We already had problems of applying the international literature to New Zealand. Uh, one reason is because we have quite shallow capital markets. The bond, the government bond market was already small. It was growing, you know, that allows you to buy more, um, but they issue more. So, you know, the net effect is whatever it is. But then uh, there is not really much of a corporate bond sector. Um, and the equity, you know, raising raise you know doing investment on the back of raising equity etc that one is also not very pronounced so we already have problems so i think it's fair to say that a lot of the tools would struggle even more in 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 even smaller countries where capital markets are yet even more different um i think conceptually maybe a forward guidance you know helps or maybe fx interventions could be relatively more attractive than uh, you know, New Zealand, so maybe just to, to wrap up, um, is one of the most um, traded um, currencies and relative to GDP, the liquidity in the FX market is super high. It's one of the highest within like G10, you know, the, the, the biggest 10. So that was for us one of the difficult factors to tease out in the purchase of foreign assets. Um, how much would we have to buy? Small country, you know, super liquid market. Um, 
so you have this intervention from Switzerland, Israel, etc. But bringing it to New Zealand was so hard. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think Professor Singh, you had your hand up before Carlo. Yeah, no, 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 that's fine. Yeah, uh, one question for uh, uh, Severin uh, again. Now, <clears throat> by through the forward guidance, you are assuring the people, um, public, that the interest rate won't change for a longer period of time. Would that not indirectly mean that this will help the banking sector to prolong their the maturity of the loan? So in a way, they are able to lend more uh, for a longer period of time, which the banks want anyway. So it is another way. It, it implicitly may not be very, 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 very starkly sends the, uh, it's not sends the message. Uh, it helps the bank uh, in, giving, in giving the loan for a longer period of time. Thank you. I'll keep it very brief. I, I wasn't really on these tools, so I'm not the expert, but I think it's fair to say it reduces potentially the uncertainty about future interest rates. Um, from what I understand, a lot of the banks, they, they hedge using swaps. So um, that's something I would need to think through again, whether it actually has an impact because, because the deposits are all hedged. Um, so it depends what happens with swap rates. But then swap rates are maybe on the lower end because you know kind of the term premium embedded in these swap rates would go down because you give more certainty. And I remember a part of the literature looks at kind of the not the first moment but the second moment, the the very the expected variance about um, future interest rates. Um, then the, the the funding for lending scheme has actually the similar idea, right? That the bank can come to us and lend, borrow at like a three-year maturity. And that that hopefully matches, you know, kind of a, at least part of the, um, the maturity um, they're lending at. So, um, and in that sense, it makes sense if the two tools are, you know, largely uh, consistent. So if you would go one year with one, but five with the other, you know, maybe they're even contradicting, but certainly probably not be the best complement. Thank you. Thank you, Severin. So last question uh, from Carlo, uh, and then we will um, move to our closing. Any further questions that can be emailed to the uh, uh, presenters? Carlo, your question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Sorry, I, I don't have a question. I just like to, um, on behalf of our four others, to thank uh, Mr. Bernhard for his value adding comments on our paper. We will uh, certainly take them on board and uh, further improve our paper. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Carlo. I certainly agree with your comments and uh, also uh, for all the other discussions. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, we now come to a, another key part of our seminar, the closing remarks, which will be delivered by Mr. Chris Becker, uh, who I, whom I have the pleasure of uh, introducing. Mr. Becker is currently working at the International Monetary Fund, advising on economics and financial markets in the office of the Executive Director for Asia and the Pacific. Previously, he worked at the Reserve Bank of Australia as head of monetary policy implementation, portfolio management and market analysis. Mr. Becker has more than 20 years experience in central banking across several roles within the bank. His work experience includes other institutions like the UBS Investment Bank, Eastern Center, Monash University, Bank for International Settlements, Bank of England, Reserve Bank of New Zealand, as well as numerous central banks in Southeast Asia. He has also worked in the Pacific region in collaboration with the World Bank, ADB, PEFTEC, and several regional agencies. Uh, Mr. Becker holds a Bachelor of Economics with honors and Master of Economics from Monash University. Uh, Mr. Becker, we welcome and invite you to deliver your closing remarks. Tanaka. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Caroline. Um, I, uh, I, I say hello to you all from the south of France, where I've been uh, stuck for a few days. I haven't been able to make it back to Washington, D.C., but hopefully I'll be able to go back tomorrow. Um, it's nice to see so many uh, familiar faces on the call. I've worked with some of you, and uh, I've, I've, I'm certainly uh, uh, honoured to be here today. Look, I had some, uh, when I was thinking about what I was going to say tonight, um, 
I thought about uh, a bunch of technical aspects to the papers, but um, I think the authors and the discussants have already done a very, very good job in covering all of that. And, uh, and the Q&A was also very interesting. So I don't think I've got much more value to, uh, to add in that respect. However, I was really struck by uh, some of the opening remarks that we, uh, that we heard today. And I think they're, they're, they're quite right in, in, the, uh, in the sense that uh, what our end output is as central bankers. And that is um, we analyze and monitor data, we write briefing papers, and we do good quality research um, with a forward looking uh, uh, application. But that's not it. And that's the thing that resonated with me. Uh, uh, that's not the end of it. That's what resonated with me from the opening remarks is you do the analysis, the research, but then you do have to do policy. That is the actual end output of, of, uh, of what central banks do. And there are all sorts of complications from that. First of all, you've got to understand the world that you live in, and that's what the analysis and research is about. And uh, even if you, uh, if you can't perfectly forecast the future, you do have to have an eye on the future and you do not have the luxury to sit there and, uh, uh, and say that, you, that uh, uh, you can't look forward. You have to make your best guesses. And so I think uh, the way I see the papers today is um, they're very interesting in, uh, in, in forming not just uh, our views on where we are now and uh, what is happening now in our, uh, in our respective economies, but knowing where you are now, of course, gives you a guide to policy and it gives you a guide to the future. So let me take them in turn. Let me say a, th a few things about um, where I see the end product of the papers or their application, if you like. On the bank lending uh, uh, paper, I, uh, I, I fully agree access to finance. Um, is, is, is incredibly in, in important, a uh, financial system is important, a well-functioning and stable banking system is important. It drives economic growth. And of course, economic growth is something that furthers economic development. So I don't think anyone would dispute that. I think that uh, um, there is a, a good part of this paper which, uh, it, that I see in terms of an application, which is, if you fully understand the drivers of bank lending and bank credit, um, and we talked a lot about in the, in the authors talked a lot in the, in, the, in the paper about demand and supply side factors. Uh, I think it's a very useful guide for central banks to fully understand that because that will shape their policies in response to shocks. For example, a, uh, a, a likely shock uh, during the COVID crisis to uh, banks potentially reigning in credit would then feed back into the demand variable that we see in the model. And uh, uh, we don't want this. And so what central banks then have to do is they have to go and uh, uh, design some policies which um, prevent the, uh, the, the type of credit crunch which, uh, which was threatening to happen. So I think there, there already the, the uh, paper uh, does some great work in, in helping us understand how such a policy might be designed. Um, the other thing, of course, and I'm not suggesting that the authors necessarily put anything like this into their papers, but it's just a little bit more to help us understand the next steps of what the what what potentially the readers of these these papers will do with them and how they will be applied. I think another uh, really important uh, aspect of bank lending, uh, specifically in the Pacific, is the importance of the international element of it because remittances are very important. They're a source of revenue. They're a source of foreign exchange. And the way that remittances um, from, from a, uh, uh, or other flows from very profitable parts of the banking business go towards um, subsidizing less profitable parts of the business. And what I've got in, in mind there is sort of banking the outer islands, right? Because uh, quite often you find uh, uh, banks that cross subsidize their, their businesses. And in that, in that sense, I think also uh, uh, one thing that's, that's uh, uh, occupying the Pacific a lot at the moment is, is, is the role of the international correspondent banking relations and how they relate to uh, um, the activity of domestic banks and indeed the stability of the domestic financial uh, system. On inflation expectations uh, in the Solomon Islands, uh, um, 
it's good to see my colleagues from the Solomon Islands again. I've I've been there on IMF missions a few times uh, to work work on the financial system. Um, I think it's very uh, useful to understand the uh, uh, not only the estimation of of the Phillips curve and how it relates to uh, inflation, but also uh, estimating its shape and how that shape shape can change over time. And of course, that is a key input into how uh, central banks' reaction functions are formed. I think it's also really important in the context, and I'm sure the authors have read all about uh, um, the uh, uh, the flattening or, or pr proposed flattening in, of the Phillips curve in, uh, in advanced countries. And uh, some of the riddles of why that is happening, of course, then leads you to uh, uh, wage formation and labor market changes over time and uh, the composition of uh, employment. I think the inflation expectations paper is also very, very important in terms of central bank communication about uh, inflation outcomes, but also about inflation forecasts into the future. I, um, I think that's, uh, uh, again, to put a very topical spin on this paper and, uh, and what I've just said about uh, central bank guidance and uh, uh, communication about inflation expectations is you can see already that as we uh, come out of this, or as some of the more advanced countries like the United States come out of uh, um, the COVID crisis, what is happening is there are supply side, uh, supply channel blockages and some inflation pressures emerging already. You can certainly see it in the US. And I think it's very important that central banks at this point in time explain that, that as uh, prices fell during the crisis, and were lower, now we're seeing them come back and come back more quickly. Uh, and I think there's a lot to be said for explaining the, not just the, the, uh, the change that you're seeing in inflation and inflation expectations, but also the level, especially if, if you've initially seen a fall and now you're just going back to the same level. Um, I think that's something that the uh, general public really needs to be uh, uh, told in the context of the current crisis. Um, we've talked a lot about RBNZ, RBNZ and other uh, advanced countries, including the Reserve Bank of Australia, of course, have had to resort to, uh, well, what do we call these policies? We had a couple of terms. We had uh, alternative monetary policy and unconventional monetary policy and QE and all of these, these, these kind of terms. But look, every country has done implemented these a little differently to each other, but Basically, it was about uh, uh, cutting interest rates and buying assets and uh, doing something to prevent a credit crunch. Uh, I, and, and so, whereas there are some uh, uh, some uh, uh, very New Zealand specific things about what the RBNZ did, um, it's got a uh, 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 it's in in the company of many many peers in terms of what it's what it's done. I uh, I think in terms of uh, what do I take away from this paper? I think what I'd like to say here is uh, something about uh, what the IMF has already talked about in terms of its uh, spring meetings and its its own communications about uh, the way forward. You know, my my whole spiel here is a, is about a forward looking element, and um, and that is how we how, how do we exit, right? How do we come out of this? What's that going to look like? Um, the, the time is very, very uh, uncertain at the moment. We don't know how many more waves or strains of coronavirus or variants of coronavirus uh, uh, virus we'll have. Um, so, you know, do we, do, we, do we exit slowly and then slip back again? I mean, this is making the forecasting job even harder than it already was. Um, I think it's also very difficult, uh, and again, you can read this in IMF publications, it's very difficult to uh, gauge how some of the variables which we thought we understood quite well in terms of monetary policy in the past, how they will react. What's GDP going to do? What's inflation going to do? What's, what are the financial stability implications uh, from having had these extraordinary unconventional measures for such a long period of time? Um, and, and then exiting them, uh, uh, exiting from that, from the, from the prolonged crisis. 
uh, we are not quite sure about that. And in many ways, I think uh, uh, a policy will be well served to very gently feel its way through, uh, uh, through this new territory, um, because uh, I think we've, had, we've seen a major structural break in how the world works, just like we did in 2007. And uh, so I don't think the challenges are going to go away. Um, let me say uh, uh, a couple of things. I mean, the Q&A session was great. There are lots of people who are interested in, 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 in uh, a very detailed um, aspects of the papers. And I think that's a really a credit to the authors that, uh, that you're able to generate sort of 30 minutes of discussion. Um, it's always a, the, uh, uh, a good sign of a paper when people, uh, people A, read it and B, want to discuss it. So I think that's great. Um, look, I'm, I'm nearly out of time. I've talked more than I actually wanted to. Uh, I, I uh, don't know whether Caroline is going to going to wrap up. So I'll, I'll say a few things in terms of thank yous. All the central bank governors and central bank staff that participated. Thank you for coming. The other participants in the uh, in the uh, uh, conference and uh, and uh, those that made comments both in the chat and and, and verbally. That was great. Uh, I know that no one else is going to do it, Caroline, so I will thank you for doing a great job as moderator of this conference. So uh, uh, thank you very much for doing that. Um, I should mention uh, uh, Parmentra and Griffith University as well for uh, organizing this inaugural conference. And I think we all hope that there are going to be many more of these conferences to come uh, that we can enjoy and that we can learn something from. Um, the RBA and RBNZ, of, of course, are the, uh, also are very supportive of uh, their Pacific neighbours and uh, have been regionally engaged for a very long time. Um, most of all, of course, uh, thank you to everyone that wrote a paper. Thank you to all the participants and thank you to all the discussants. And I will leave you with that. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Mr. Becker. Uh, completely agree with your sentiments. Uh, and we have to thank you for your very useful feedback uh, on our deliberations today and sharing very useful takeaways for us. Uh, I like what you said that, uh, you know, what matters for researchers and what we should not miss is the end product. Uh, you know, that our research work uh, should be importantly linked to policy advice and action. Uh, so, uh, with that, I believe we have come to the end of our seminar. Uh, from many is there, and I'm sure we, you all agree that uh, you know, our presentations uh, and discussions today have been very rich and have further boosted our knowledge and learning on these uh, relevant topics. And I think, importantly, it's further strengthened our bond, bond as a regional central bank family. And as Mr. Becker said, I also trust that this is only the start of such seminars, and we look forward to seeing more of these in the future. And from my end, my great appreciation uh, to everyone for you know making this seminar possible, especially to Pramen and uh, and Chris, and especially to our speakers uh, for their time and effort. I know it took a lot of time to get these papers together, and importantly for me today uh, for sticking uh, commendably to their time. So thank you for that, and also to all you participants that have joined in today. A big vinakavaka level. Thank you, Tenakoto, and thank you, Tomas, to you all. Take care and stay safe. Uh, and now I hand over to, to Praman Inaka. Oh, thank you, Caroline. Thank you very much for doing a great job. I didn't know that I was going to speak at the end. Uh, everybody, thank you once again very much for, um, uh, for your time this morning. All the speakers, the discussants, and everybody in the panel, as well as all the attendees. Uh, uh, I think uh, what we are doing here, what we have been doing for a little while and we are continuing to do is uh, to create a research community uh, for the region. And that's a great thing for the region, I think, especially for the central banks. So as the, um, um, as, as Andrew made uh, in his um, opening remarks, commented that uh, for central bankers, the research does not stop with publishing papers, it will have to go beyond that. It will have to take some sort of, um, some form of policy. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think um, that's what we should be aiming for. Publishing in good journals is a good is sign of, sign that uh, we are uh, doing a good job, that the uh, methods we have employed and the results we have are sound. But for, in the case of central bankers, it will have to be beyond that. So. 
I think that's something that we are going to start talking about very soon. We have had a chance to talk about that with the governors and others at the regional conference and, and elsewhere, but we need to talk a little bit more about that uh, to see uh, how we can develop this into or take these papers to the next step, which is policy. Thank you. With those words, thank you very much, Caroline, for doing a great job and everybody else, uh, Vinaka Bakalevu. Uh, there is a survey as we usually have and I will be sending that link to you. I hope you'll be able to spend just a few minutes, five minutes at the most to give us some feedback so that we can do better next time. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.